Book Three of Four, Roads End, Chapter Fifteen, The Turn. She was immersed in the newspapers the greater part of the day Sunday. Four to five pages of each paper were devoted to the fire. There were photographs of the building with its charred and blackened windows, of the throngs of parents, relatives and friends of the victims as they stood huddled together before the morgue like frightened children, of the grim lines of ambulances, and lastly, of the long rows of the dead. The tone of the papers was shaky. It was as if the newspapers and whatever entered into their makeup, the writers, the editors, had shared with the employees of the Princess Waste Company the horrors of the fire, as if they had faced death, had made up their minds to die, and then lived to tell the tale. The long black columns vibrated with fear and exhaled the breath of death. Carried away by the immensity of the tragedy, some of the writers were writing their pens with extreme boldness. They were speaking in harsh tones about neglect by the city authorities, by the manufacturers. It was criminal to coop up human beings, women, girls, mere children, ten stories above ground, in the midst of inflammable material. Work should be brought down to earth. The arrangement of the factory was described. The rows upon rows of machines with scant passageway between them. The place had been a fire trap from the beginning. It was a raw deal the workers were getting. Late in the afternoon, Hilda went down with the child for a walk. The street seemed to have become like one family, sharing in a common misfortune. There were no formalities, no introductions. People talked to one another about the fire, about the dead. There was pain in every face and a smoldering resentment in every voice. Hardly a man in the district but had a daughter, a sister, a sweetheart working in just such a factory as the princess had been, and there was no telling when their turn would come. She walked from street to street. Here and there, a crowd was gathered before a tenement. A girl from that tenement had been burned in the fire, and her remains had been brought home from the morgue. Hilda searched the faces of the men in these crowds, and it seemed to her that a mighty word spoken to them, and they would rise. They would rise in large numbers, rise by the thousands in revolt against the social order, a mighty, a powerful word, but who would speak it? Who could prove such a leader? Frank Hillstrom. She was thinking of Hillstrom. Where was he? It had been a poor Sunday for little Raymond. She had scarcely given him any attention, had not played with him all day, and as he lingered over his supper, the child gazed at her with large, inquisitive eyes, but without complaint or whimper. It was as if the little one felt that his mother was going through a great crisis, and he too was subdued. Hilda caught his gaze, and a wave of pity and reproach came over her. The child might have been a helpless orphan now, a waif, and there she was, not even thinking of him, neglecting him. She took him in her arms, and they clung to one another for a long time like lovers who had made up after a quarrel. She devoted herself to the child the rest of the evening, and as she caressed his head and the somber little face that was searchingly peering into her own, she became aware of a change in him. He was older. He was. Nobody would dispute it with her, make her believe otherwise. The events of the past thirty hours had had their effect upon little Raymond. She and her son were nearer to one another, more of an age with one another. 
Soon, soon, she would have someone, if not to talk to her, at least to listen to her. Just before she fell asleep, worry over the future, her future, their future, crowded out all else from her thoughts. The fire had thrown her existence out of gear. She would have to look for work, look for a job again. The melancholy, the faint dread, which she invariably experienced just before going out to look for her job, seized her. But she shook off this mood in the next breath. After what had happened the previous afternoon, life held no more terrors for her. There was nothing she would be afraid to face, she and her child. Nothing, nothing, nothing. She and her child. From force of habit, she wound the clock to ring at the usual hour the next morning, and once awake, she went through with the customary routine and took the child to the nursery. Then she started for the factory. She wanted to have one more look at it. The elevated train was packed the same as every other day. Young girls, women, men were going to work. Almost everyone was absorbed in his newspaper and the story of the fire. Some of the faces were stolid, and others, fear was lurking. Hilda had once watched a man administer a lashing to his dog. The animal fled, but after a little returned and, with fear still lurking in its eyes, was sniffing for its master's favor. She thought of that incident as she was gazing at the girls, the women, the men, on their way to work. In front of the building were crowds of the curious. On their way to work, people stopped and gazed up to the tenth story, where in place of windows, one saw only deep black holes. The fire lines had been removed. The pavement had been washed clean of blood. Before the door of the building, policemen were standing. Sometime during the morning, a coroner's jury would visit the scene of the fire. Hilda looked about for someone she knew. Perhaps she would find some of the girls she worked with and who had escaped. But they were not there, not one. There was a week's wages due her. All the employees had a week's wages coming to them. She wondered how the girls would go about collecting it. She thought about the union, Mr. Raboff. She ought to go and see Raboff. The few times she had seen him, he had been very friendly. She started for the headquarters of the union, but she was in no hurry, and she wandered slowly through the streets. It was a warm spring day, the kind of a day to forget one's troubles, but there was no forgetting for her. The faces she had looked for in vain in front of the factory she found at the offices of the union. The large waiting room was jammed with people. The girls who had saved themselves from the fire were there telling of their escape to eager listeners. The aged fathers and mothers, the relatives and friends of those killed, Jews, Italians, Slavs, all seemed united in the fellowship of sorrow. Some were weeping, Others were calling for justice and retribution. They wanted revenge on the bosses. Several girls recognized Hilda and smiled a greeting to her, glad to welcome her among the living. But she had no friends among them, and after straying in the crowd for some time, she went up to the window leading into the inner office and asked to see Mr. Raboff. She gave her name to the girl attendant. Before the girl brought back the answer, hasty footsteps were heard behind the partition, a door sharply opened, and Raboff, his thin, pallid face whiter than ever, his long hair disheveled, stood before her. Without a word, he took hold of both her hands and literally pulled her into his office. 
When they were seated, he gazed at her silently, as one does at a child from whom one had been separated and who had changed and grown in the meantime. I'm trying to make sure, Raboff's face twitched into a strange smile as he spoke, that it's you. You see, we had given you up for dead, Mrs. Raboff and I. He produced a card, the card she had signed that summer Sunday in the park when he first met her. Her address was on it. I was just going to send someone over to your place to see what had become of your child, he continued. I believe you have no relatives in New York. He was silent for some moments, his forehead wrinkled, and the dark circles about his eyes stood out with tragic sharpness. Hilda suspected he was thinking of Mrs. Breen. She was preparing to describe her last moments with Ada and awaited his question. But the question was not forthcoming. Raboff was plunged in thought. The noise in the waiting room was gaining in volume. A girl came in and informed him that the place could not hold the crowds. He gave orders to divert them to another hall in the same building. What do they want? Raboff suddenly turned on Hilda. There was agony in his eyes. She was puzzled. She did not understand him. He continued, speaking in a racked voice. You saw the crowd. Not more than a fifth of them belonged to our organization. But be that as it may, they came to us because they have faith in us, because they know that we are on their side, that we stand with the workers. They want something. What is it they want? What do you think they want? You are one of the people standing in the hall. You went through the fire. They are hysterical and cannot talk or think coherently. But you are calm. You have different blood in your veins. You have more self-assurance, maybe because you were born in this country. I appoint you a committee of one to speak for them. Tell me what they want the union to do for them in this crisis. A curious feeling came over Hilda. Raboff was in dead earnest. She was to think, to speak for the girls in the Princess Waste Factory, for their parents, for the girls in other factories. Raboff was speaking once more. You come to the union as the patient comes to the doctor. But the patient helps the doctor make his diagnosis. He tells the physician what his troubles are, describes his pains and aches. Now you do as much for us. Tell us what ails you in the shops, what you want, what you must have. Keep in mind that we cannot restore the dead and that in practice, we can give only a minimum. There were many things in Hilda's mind, many vehement words at the tip of her tongue about the injustice of society, about the capitalist system. But Raboff was a socialist. He had told her so, and he was asking for the minimum. She recalled her trip that morning, the elevated train. It had been crowded as usual. People had to eat, to live, and they overcame their fear and went to work. What was the first thing those people needed? What would help them most? She overcame a dryness in her throat and spoke. The first thing to do, I should say, is to make the shops safe. Raboff's face lighted up. Stop right there, he cried. Say no more. You've hit the problem. Make the shops safe. That is a practical answer, an American answer, I might say, straight to the point. That's what the union will attempt. That's probably what it may be able to achieve. He was reflecting for some moments and Hilda waited. He again spoke up abruptly. I want you to work with us here in the office. 
Her breath was short. She stammered something about not being prepared for office work. Raboff picked up the card upon which her name and address was written in a very clear, legible hand. Oh, yes, you are prepared. He spoke with assurance. Don't worry about that. We need you. We have work for you. Can you start right away? You haven't anything you must do now this morning. No, there was nothing she had to do that morning. Hilda was in a daze. Send in Miss Wald, he spoke into the receiver. Miss Wald entered, a tall, dark Jewish girl, and he told her that Mrs. Thorson was to work with them. Miss Wald might start her with the usual office routine now, but later Mrs. Thorson would have most to do with the Making the Shops Safe campaign, which the union was inaugurating. As Hilda rose to follow the office manager into the next room, Raboff also rose and shook hands with her. Good luck to us, he smiled. Hilda was on the verge of tears. Deep in her heart, a feeling of shame was stirring. Did the union really need her, she was wondering, or was Mr. Raboff trying to atone for some neglect? Was it Mrs. Breen's death that was on his conscience? The fact that Ada could not or would not take a position with the union? The fact that she had avoided contact with her former friends? She felt that Ada belonged in the place which she, Hilda, was getting. She was profiting by her friend's death. The dead were buried. More than 100,000 people participated in the demonstration which followed the funeral. The newspapers treated the affair with the utmost respect. In the evening, a large mass meeting was held in Carnegie Hall. It was not a labor gathering, but a mass meeting of leading citizens. The city paying its tribute to the dead, so the newspapers announced. The meeting was addressed by a bishop, a senator, a banker. Much fine oratory flowed. The senator quoted Abraham Lincoln on the dignity of labor with strong effect. The bishop dwelt on the life and precepts of the carpenter of Galilee and called upon the world to rededicate itself to the task of brotherhood which the carpenter had preached and for which the carpenter had died. The banker who had come to America as an immigrant and had himself once worked in a factory addressed the workers as sisters and brothers and praised their nobility of heart. From praise of the workers, he turned to praise of the country. He began extolling America for the wonderful opportunities she offers to all, for making no distinction between rich and poor, and the banker suddenly realized that he had been carried away by his own voice, that it was not a Fourth of July gathering, that his remarks were not appropriate to the occasion. He stuttered a few unintelligible phrases and burst into tears, drawing a great deal of applause thereby. Hilda sat in a box with Mrs. Raboff and one or two other labor leaders and their wives. She had paid a quarter of a dollar to her neighbor's girl to sit through that evening with the child so that she, Hilda, could go to the meeting. Toward the close, Hillstrom, who had come to New York the same day that Hilda took up her work with the Union, but of whom she had had only a fleeting glimpse thus far, came up and sat down beside her. When the meeting was over, he walked home with her. She asked him whether he thought the meeting would do any good. Words, words, Hillstrom said with a deprecating wave of his hands. We are the greatest nation for words, for making speeches, promises which we have no intention to fulfill. If one-tenth of the beautiful sentiments the speakers have uttered this evening were carried out, we could stop agitating for socialism tomorrow. 
the world would be a Garden of Eden without it. All differences and injustices would be wiped out and the golden rule enthroned. But not a word of what has been said tonight will be put into effect, will be carried out, at least not by those who said it. As speaker after speaker, well-fed, well-groomed, and trained in the art of oratory, in the trick of carrying away his audience, went on with his frenzied perorations tonight. I was looking up on the walls of Carnegie Hall. How cynical those walls must be of us people, both of those who do the fooling and of those who let themselves be fooled. They walked on silently for some time. But there is some good in these speeches, after all, Hillstrom resumed. Society is indicting itself. Our civilization is indicting itself in those speeches. It is making damaging admissions about its injustices, about its incapacity to divide the loaf of human happiness fairly among all. These admissions may be forgotten for the moment, but they will not be lost. They are like promissory notes. They may be long-term notes, but they will be paid. If we do not collect them, the generation that follows us will. And woe to the masters on that day of reckoning. They had reached the tenement where Hilda lived. Hillstrom recalled it. You remember, he said, we were going to have a popcorn party some evening. Hilda remembered she had been waiting for him to come, but the textile strike had come along just then. Yes, he reflected, I really shouldn't make any appointments or promises. I never can tell whether I'll be able to keep them. I am like the weather vane turning with the winds, the social winds, strikes, trouble. It's an interesting life anyway, Hilda said with a sigh. Hillstrom sought to penetrate her with his gaze. It was the first time she had dropped a hint about her personal affairs. He had been wondering about her life. He judged that her past, like his own, was a book sealed with seven seals. Yes, he said, it keeps you on the move, and that's good for a character like myself. I suppose, he continued with a smile in which Hilda read an immense lot of pathos, I suppose I am a Mephistopheles of a kind. I have broken away from the bourgeois heaven from which I sprung. I despise it. It's good for me to keep busy, to keep roving from one end of the country to the other. But... We shall have our popcorn party yet. He suddenly brightened up. We shall have it soon, as soon as the Union has reached some definite decision with regard to the campaign for making the shop safe. Decision? Hilda repeated. I did not know that the Union had gone that far with any plan. I have talked to Raboff and to the other Union leaders today, Hillstrom affirmed and I laid some plans before them. The safety of the workers, to my mind, is a matter for the workers themselves to look after. Let every worker report the conditions in his or her shop to the union, and let the union report the unsafe shops to the authorities and force them to action. The call which the union issued to the workers in the next few days embodied the ideas set forth by Frank Hillstrom. By the end of the week, hundreds of complaints against unsafe shops had come in. Hilda was assigned to keep track of these complaints. At the end of a month, she was working with two assistants. During the summer, the campaign had grown too big for the union to handle. A shop safety committee was organized to take over this work. The committee was to have separate offices and was to employ 10 factory inspectors. Hilda, because of her affiliation with the campaign from the beginning, 
was among the first to be offered a place with this committee. She accepted. It was on the Saturday afternoon in September that Hilda cleared her desk in the office of the Waste Workers Union for the last time. Mr. Raboff and the other officials were absent, and the girls, including the office manager, Miss Wald, gathered about her and talked with restrained excitement. They looked upon Hilda with the same enigmatic questioning with which they had met her five months earlier when she first came to work among them. Then Hilda had come out of the factory into a $60 a month office job. Now she was leaving this job for one that would pay her $100 a month. With the increased salary would come a corresponding prestige. She was making a place for herself in the labor movement. For a while, Hilda shared their excitement. The feeling of power was pleasant, and she had acquired power, power over herself. She had mastered the office routine to the last detail in those five months. Though her work did not call for it, she had cultivated the typewriter, and in her spare hours, she was studying stenography, which had been the goal of her girlhood dreams. She could go out and get an office job anywhere now. But the feeling of excitement soon subsided, and in its place came a melancholy brooding over the turn her life had taken. It was Raymond who had converted her vague dreaming about office work into an ardent wish. Work in an office instead of in a factory, he had once told her, would make a great difference in her life, in her social status. She had then believed in social status, had looked up to wealth and to power. Then the job, which was now hers, an office job, would have evoked dreams of an ambitious marriage, of luxury, ease, of afternoon teas, bazaars, philanthropic entertainments. All these things meant nothing to her now. She was in fact the sworn enemy of these things, of the people who indulged in them. She was the enemy of the civilization which fostered these social castes and parasites. She and that civilization were definitely at war were arrayed on opposite sides of the barricades. Her new job, she felt, would rest heavy on her shoulders. She would pay dearly for the extra comforts she would derive from it. She would never quite free herself from the feeling of apology, of guilt to those whom she had left below, to the hundreds of girls who had died in the factory fire, to the thousands upon thousands of others who were exposing themselves daily to similar deaths and dangers. She was no better than they. She had no more rights than they, was deserving of no greater privileges.